Okay, many thanks for inviting me. Uh, unfortunately, my Italian is not so good, so this will be in English. But I'll uh, hopefully, there's a lot of images, so hopefully it'll be okay. Right, first of all, thanks for inviting me to this beautiful city. I've just had a walk around, and it's uh, truly lovely in the sun. This, this is where we come from. I come from uh, Bournemouth Hospital, which is a general hospital in the south of England, on the south coast of England. 900 beds. It's the regional cardiac centre, and it has uh, uh, nine cardiologists, has two cardiac radiologists, of which I am one. Um, we have an imaging cardiologist and a fellow. So we provide this service as a team. And I'm just going to talk about our experience of um, 640 slice CT over the last two and a half years and how it's changed our experience compared with our original uh, CT scanner. So cardiac CT is not a new technique. This is data from 2005 to 2006. This is 64 slice data. And even then, this is six years ago, it shows down the bottom here, you can show a very, very good negative predictive value. So if the ca cardiac CT, this is six years ago, if the cardiac CT on 64 slice is normal, then it is normal. So great data. So why isn't cardiac CT a routine examination? It's not a routine examination in England. I suspect it's not in Italy. It's not in the USA. It's not a still cardiac catheterization is still very common. So there's lots of reasons not to do cardiac CT and these are some of them that people often give. Number one, high radiation dose for cardiac CT. Another one, people say it's too difficult. It takes too time consuming, it takes too long. And it's too difficult to train the radiographers, the techs, it's just it's too complicated. And it's not robust, I, it doesn't always work. That, these are the reasons people give. So I'm just gonna, just going over those points, I'm gonna give you the history of what we went through at Bournemouth. So in 2004, we started a cardiac CT service on a spiral scanner, conventional spiral scanner, 16 slice at the time, initially as a 16 slice, 0.4 rotation, 16 slice, state of the art in 2004. And with, but with that scanner, it was an old scanner, but that sometimes provided very good images. This shows um, a conventional coronary angiogram. It shows the LAD here. Can't see too much going on. Looks okay. This is the CT scan, same patient, same projection. And you can see a non-calcified plaque here with a calcified component in the middle, potentially unstable. So it, CT sometimes was very good. But the problem we had is it took, it was difficult. It took time, it took a lot of effort, and it took a lot of practice. This is 2004, when we first got the scanner. 2008, the images were looking better, but it was just very difficult. There were lots of options. Did we do prospective? Did we do retrospective? Did we do ECG modulation? How much contrast did we give? Did we use dual bolus? It was very difficult. And because of all that, the radiation doses were very high. And it, we were giving about mean dose of about 15 to 20 millisieverts. And that sounds terrible, but that's still not so unusual. There are still sites with 64 detector machines that are still giving 15 to 20 millisieverts, sometimes more. But the real problem was not just the radiation dose. The real problem was the coronary arteries often look like this. This was not that unusual. This was the LAD. I can tell that there is an LAD, but that's kind of it. I can't tell whether there's disease. So this patient got 20 millisieverts and they will still need a conventional cardiac um, coronary angiogram. Was, the test didn't work. So cardi for us, cardiac CT with conventional technology was, was good, but it was a specialist examination. It wasn't a main examination. So with cardiac CT with us, cardiac CT was using retrospective gating, which was the standard technique gave 10 to 25 millisieverts of radiation, much higher dose than the cardiac catheterization, and something had to change. We had to change something. 
So this is the first way, this is the, with conventional CT scans, this is the first way of reducing radiation dose. This is step and shoot, prospective gating. Essentially the scanner takes four centimeters of data at the end of diastole. So just the radiation, short radiation pulse moves, short radiation pulse moves, takes another radiation pulse moves. So it only acquires data when the heart is still at end diastole and not throughout the whole cardiac cycle. So this step and shoot, called by GE, prospective gating, called by some others, is the standard low-dose technique now on most systems. And in sinus rhythm, as long as the heart rate is low and as long as it's very stable, the doses of less than six millisieverts are possible. So it is possible to obtain low doses. But there are problems. The scanning is every second heartbeat at best. It takes an image, it moves, heartbeat goes on, take another image, it moves, another few heartbeats, it takes another image. So the whole process can take a long time. It can take 15 seconds to acquire the whole, the whole heart. And a lot can go wrong in 15 seconds. So it's, mu it's, it's less robust than conventional retrospective coronary angiography. So it's low dose, but, but it's uh, not so robust. So step and shoot is OK for low stable heart rates. But what about high heart rates? Well, most 64 detector systems, most conventional CT scanners switch to retrospective. So high dose again. This just shows retrospective gating. The tube is on throughout the whole cardiac cycle and throughout the whole acquisition. So not only does the radiation, it, it, you only need this bit of the radiation dose just when the heart is still, but you actually, the radiation is on for the whole cardiac cycle. But it's worse than that because it's spiral and so there is no gaps. It has to oversample by about two and a half times. So that's very wasteful of radiation, even with dose modulation. This is diagrammatically, this is all the, the radiation dose it needs for the whole cardiac cycle, but it actually has to use two and a half beats. So it's oversampling. So it's a very high radiation dose technique. So there's a major problem with all of these techniques with 64 detector systems, is the images are acquired over multiple heartbeats and there are multiple blocks of data, and it all needs to be put together afterwards. And this only works, only works well, if the heart is perfectly regular, completely regular, and a low heart rate. And the patient needs to be able to hold their breath perfectly for 15 seconds. And in our experience, this is rare. This doesn't happen so often. This is just a 60-year-old man when he holds his breath, the heart rate increases. In this man, not so much. This is a 30-year-old woman. When she holds a heart rate, this is what the, uh, her, she holds a breath. Sorry, this is what happens to her heart rate. It increases very fast. This is sinus rhythm, but this is what happens to young people. And this shows the problem. This is with conventional systems. Patient holds their breath, and the heart rate is varying. So this heartbeat, the top one, is OK, end, end diastole. The next acquisition is kind of OK. It's a bit earlier, but not so good. The next one is bad. It's on systole. It's on the R wave. The heart is contracting. So that this data block will be blurred. This one will be blurred, and this one will be blurred. So the, the, the process will not work, because the heart rate is varying. So because most of these pulses are not end diastole. So the images are low dose, but they still look like this. So this is step and shoot. So they still look like this. So it's, the patient got five millisieverts, but it's, a, it's five millisieverts wasted because there's no images. And if you use retrospective with a patient with a very, high, uh, very uh, varying heart rate, the images can still look like this. There's multiple steps still. So the patient's got a high radiation dose this time, and it still didn't work. It's because the heart rate is varying. So, with all of that, this leads to a failure rate of about 10 to 
with conventional 64 detector CT. Even if you exclude conditions such as atrial fibrillation, even if you exclude all those patients, it still fails 10 to 15 percent of the time. So those patients get radiation but no result. So to eliminate the step artifacts, to get rid of those artifacts, and to improve the robustness of the technique so it works every time, in my opinion, the heart has to be imaged in one block, one rotation, one heartbeat. At the moment, that is only possible on one, one machine, which is the machine we have, which is the uh, Aquilion 1, which is a single rotation machine. This is our Aquilion 1. This is on YouTube. So just to explain about detector coverage, there's lots of... Um, people say some strange things about the number of slices their machines have, so I'll just show it diagrammatically. This is, the, this is the detector coverage. All 64 detector systems and all 128 slice systems only cover 4 centimeters maximum. So that's all they cover. And this includes the Siemens, even the dual tube, even the Siemens flash only covers this much. All GE systems cover that. The Philips, which is 128 detector system, covers a little more, but still not the whole heart. And the Aquilion 1 covers the full 16 centimetres, so not just 4 centimetres, it covers 16 centimetres maximum, the whole heart. So with the Aquilion 1, it does step and shoot, but without the step, it's shoot. So the whole heart, one rotation. So is, that's all very interesting. Is, is a very wide detector useful? Is it good? You know, do you want to spend that money? Well, this is the principle of the Aquilian 1, the cardiac CT. It's one beat, one rotation, and it's one block of data. It's one block of data at one point of time. And the key thing is it's very low radiation dose. For cardiac, it's about between about 0.4 millisieverts, we got one yesterday, and about 3 millisieverts for a bigger patient. It's not spiral, so it never has to use retrospective mode. And it's got a very high spatial resolution, 0.5 millimeter detectors. It's the high, 0.35 in all, in all direction, 0.35 millimeters. So it's the highest spatial resolution of any machine at the moment. And, but the most important thing is it's very, very robust. It works in all heart rhythms, including atrial fibrillation. And it's the only machine that does that at the moment. So does the very wide beam cause image quality problems? So the detector is very wide. It's a very wide detector. So the cone beam angle is very wide. It's 14 degrees, much, much wider than 64 detector. So the computing power to, make, to deal with that is huge. We have a whole room of computer. But contrary to what some other people say, it doesn't break the laws of physics. It's just a very difficult calculation. It just needs a big computer. And this is how it works. Heart rate's going along there. It waits for the end diastole. It turns on its radiation pulse, and then it just switches off. So it's just 70 to 80% pulse, one beat, one rotation. And it has 10% padding. It has a little tolerance. Within that 70 to 80%, there's 10%. So the scanner will automatically reconstruct the stillest phase, the perfect phase, within that 10% at end diastole, so the coronaries are always perfectly stable, perfectly still, sorry, not stable. This just shows it diagrammatically. So yeah, a 70% reconstruction, it's, it's good. If compared with 64 detector, it's fantastic. This is the right coronary, a little bit blurred. Some people say that's soft plaque, but interestingly, it isn't soft plaque, because when you do the perfect reconstruction, the machine does the perfect phase at 75%. There's, it's, it's still the right coronary and the soft plaque has gone away because there's no movement. This is a surprise for us. We found this very useful. One rotation has a big advantage. When the heart rate, patient's heart rate is 65 or 70 beats per minute at rest, when they breathe in and hold their breath, the heart rate drops for about one or two beats. That it drops by about 15 beats per minute often and there's a trough in heartbeat. And because we only need one heartbeat, we catch that. So we catch a lower heart rate. So the image quality is better. With 64 detector, it takes 15 seconds. So you can't, you can't do that. 
So the technology is much more sophisticated than 64 detector spiral, conventional technology. But the scanning process is much, much easier. This is what we do. We do two puffs of GTN. We give IV metoprolol, pretty standard. We give it up to 50 milligrams IV. That's, you, if you're going to give IV, you have to give a lot. To con we do that to control the heart rate. We give niapam 370 at five mils a second, pretty standard. We, we, we give between 60 and 80 mils, depending on the patient's size. And we do one rotation every time. And it's the only cardiac scanner at the moment that can reliably cope with arrhythmias at the moment. So it waits, because like Scaramanga here in James Bond, it only needs one shot. So ectopic beats are no problem. It waits for ectopic beat comes, it waits, and it fires on the next one. So this shows it here, atrial fibrillation. We have very high success with atrial fibrillation. The scanner, it's, it's irregular here. The scanner waits for a still phase, and then it fires once, then switches off. This is a typical image in atrial fibrillation. It's one block of data, and it's perfectly still. You see the right coronary there is perfectly still. There's no steps. There's no step. With all other scanners, there are multiple step artifacts, even with atrial fibrillation. It's just not a good image. But with this, it looks like sinus rhythm. And the other thing it do, it can handle obese patients. So this is someone with a BMI of 48, only, only a total dose of four millisieverts. It's a BMI of 65, this is seven millisieverts. But these are pretty good images for a BMI of 65. So what happens if the heart rate's more than 65 and you can't give beta blockers or, or the beta blockers are not effective? We still give one beat, but we just widen the pulse. So we can do end systolic and end diastolic reconstructions. But it's still one beat, and it's much more efficient than retrospective. So the dose is still less than about five millisieverts. So it's multiphase reconstruction. We do an end systolic recon at high heart rates, and you still get very good images of the coronary arteries. This shows an aortic root abscess, false aneurysm at a heart rate of 80 beats a minute. It's still. It's still. It's an aberrant right coronary, 70 beats a minute, again, end systolic reconstruction. So what about radiation dose? Well, cardiac catheterization is about 6 to 7 millisieverts. Conventional cardiac CT is 12 to millisievert, 15 millisieverts, if you're lucky. But so can we do better? Well, these are some typical cases. Some with a BMI of 18, they get 0.6 millisieverts, total dose. That includes the triggering. We can be, we're even lower than that sometimes, but that's about the average. So some with a BMI of 20, a little bigger, they 0.98 millisievert, so still less than one millisievert. Patients get this bit bigger, BMI of 26, dose of 1.26 millisieverts, still excellent image quality, no step artifacts, still low dose. So for us, the risk of driving to the hospital, and I'm sure this is true in Italy too, is much greater than the risk of the scan. The radiation dose is just not an issue for us anymore. So what's the equivalent, what's single rotation technology done for us? It's all very clever. What's it done? Well, the main thing is it's e much easier than 64 detector, and it's completely robust. Our failure rate, including atrial fibrillation, we do everyone. We, the only patients we exclude are patients who cannot lie on the table. But with that, our failure rate is less than 3%, compared with about 15% with spiral, with 64 detector. We give very low radiation doses always, with very good image quality, about 0.5 to 2.5 millisieverts. Important thing for us is we're a general hospital, but all of our radiographers, all of our techs now scan hearts. All 21 of them do, not just two. It used to be two before, now it's 21. And because it's so easy, we have a very high patient throughput. We can scan 12 patients in four hours now easily. We used to only scan five. So how did it affect the radiographers, the techs? Well, this is what they look like with spiral, with 64 detector. They said, do we do retrospective, prospective, step and shoot, dose modulation? You know, that you could never find them because they were in the toilet. They didn't want to scan the patients. But with Quillian 1, it's, it's easy. So with us, the, what it's given us is the most difficult CT examination becomes the easiest. It's as easy to scan a heart as it is to scan a head. And just to scare you, this is what happens to our throughput. So this is with 
similar scanning time to before. There's, it's not too difficult to tell where the Aquilian 1 came in. This is, this is conventional technology. As soon as that came in, we scan about 10 times as many patients as we used to. So we now scan over 1,000 per year, and the images are always good. So just to summarize, if scanners were computers, 64 detector machines, which are kind of an interim technology, I feel, would be windows. So they're a little bit complicated, a little bit difficult to use. Sometimes they work, and sometimes they don't. An equilling one would be like the Steve Jobs here. It would be the iPad. It's easy to use, and it always works. And thank you very much for your time, and I think I'm on time.